Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, today. Thank you for the ones that you bring here to this church. Thank you for your word to us. Those wonderful words of life. Thank you that it's a light for our path. I pray that you'll move in close to our hearts this morning and do a fresh work of grace. I pray that you use everything that we offer up to you this morning to further your kingdom. Meet us heart to heart here this morning. Make our hearts tender. Grant it this morning. We ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm glad to be here this morning. You glad to be here? If you're glad to be here, turn to somebody near you and say, where are we going for lunch? Anyone want to sing a solo for us? No? <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead and uh, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the New Testament, Colossians chapter 3. Uh, last time we began to uh, look at chapter 3 of Colossians, and <clears throat> we were reading where the Apostle Paul says, if, if you are a Christian, then you need to be living in a manner pleasing to the Lord. You should be setting your hearts and minds on things above. Uh, you need to be seeking things that are heavenly and hold eternal value and won't perish on this earth. He said, desire Jesus Christ above all things. Live a life and do things that will be pleasing to him. He says to put to death your earthly nature. And uh, he actually lists some of those worldly things that we need to kill off in our, in our sinful life. In verse 5, he listed uh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. And he says, that's the old you. That's the kind of life you used to live. And then in verse 8, he adds to the list anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And then he says, do not lie to each other. And then in verse 11, he wants us to understand that salvation is for everybody. Right? Jews, Gentiles, barbarians, slave and free, rich and poor, every group of people. He says Christ is all and is in all. And for the Christian, Christ is their all. He's their only Lord and, uh, and Savior and all their hope and happiness. He's all in all things to them. So that brings us to our passage today where Paul closes out this section of the chapter. Um, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 12 to 17 this morning. You ready? He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I mean, God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So Paul offers here a description of what the Christian church should look like. How we should be 
uh, live in our lives as Christians, as individuals, and as the body. Notice that there's a, a shift with verse 12. Paul moves from a negative to a positive in his urging here. Last time we looked at what uh, we need to be putting off of our lives, and today we're looking at what we need to be putting on in our lives as born-again believers. Uh, there's also a shift from personal morality to social duties uh, within the Christian community. So uh, let's take a closer look at these virtues uh, of Christian behavior that Paul says to clothe yourselves uh, with as God's people. Look at verse 12 with me. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, he says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now remember, Paul writes this letter to the church. Uh, he, just, he just takes it as they were true followers, that, that they have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. That's who he's writing to here. The Christian church, the body of Christ. Well, Christ is the head of the body. So the church should reflect him in our relationships, in our walk, uh, in our witness. Verse 11 says that for us, Christ is all and is in all. And then uh, we Christians ought to reflect his image, right? Christ-likeness, Christ-likeness. As Paul begins to list these virtues, he starts out with compassion, the King James Version says it like this. Uh, it says, bowels of mercies. Does that sound kind of weird? Bowels of mercies. Here's what it's referring to. It's referring to the inner parts of a person. Not just physically, but as the deep central location of emotion within someone. Does that make sense? Like when someone says that they have a gut feeling about something, okay? Uh, so put on bowels of mercies or put on a compassion that touches and affects the innermost part of your being. And then he says in verse 12, clothe yourselves with kindness. The word that's used for uh, kindness here in the Greek speaks to the kindness that God shows us, which leads to repentance. Paul's talking about an inward, tender, genuine mercy that we should be showing to all people, especially to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when someone who professes to be a Christian shows mercy with a cheerfulness, that can be a very attractive, appealing trait for, uh, to a non-believer to see a believer having that. You know, instead of an attitude like, well, fine, I guess I'm supposed to forgive you. So just don't do it again, okay? You know, that kind of attitude. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. When it comes to our interactions and relationships with people, uh, out in the world and in the church, we should reflect God's kindness uh, to us in Christ. And then the third thing that Paul says we should clothe ourselves with is humility. You know, in our society, true humility is a virtue that is usually admired, wouldn't you say? In fact, uh, maybe you've heard people brag about how humble they are. No? <laughs> But in the ancient world, it was actually looked down upon because it was thought of as weak and cowardly. And, and it, looked at, uh, uh, as, it looked at as something for children or, or slaves. That's what humility was looked at as. Humility isn't something the Greeks would have ever applied to their own lives. Um, but as we read about humility in the Bible, it's very different. It's very different meaning. We even read how Jesus is described as being humble. In Philippians uh, chapter 2, it says that Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient 
to death, even to death on a cross. And throughout Scripture, we're, we're called to serve God and to serve others in humility. Ancient Greeks saw humility as weak and cowardly, but the Bible rep, uh, presents humility as the absence of conceit and arrogance. And when we give our life to Christ and we come to realize who we are and who God is, uh, the creator of all that there is, uh, we can't help but to feel humility deep within ourselves. And then number four, Paul says to clothe yourselves with gentleness, or maybe your Bible says meekness. People usually mistake meekness as weakness. True? You know, I researched that word meekness, and here's uh, how I found it defined. It, it says, a calm temper of mind, not easily provoked. The quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's own importance. Strength under control. I like that. Strength under control. I came across a quote that says, The quietness and openness and vulnerability of meekness is very beautiful and very painful. It goes against all that we are by our sinful nature. It requires a supernatural help. Isn't that true? And Jesus being our model of gentleness and meekness, Matthew 11 uh, says that he's gentle and humble in heart. But he wasn't weak or afraid to speak his mind. His strength was under control. And Jesus handled himself in a way that honored his heavenly father. And that's what Paul's calling the church to here. And then Paul says, clothe yourselves with patience. Again, it's, it's a virtue that Jesus has towards us. Um, and aren't you glad? I am. But we should show that to, to each other. The definition for patience is this. Quietly and steadily persevering. Enduring provocation, hardship, or trying circumstances. And then it says, catch this part. Without complaint or anger. Yeah. You know, Paul's given us a description of what the Christian church should look like. It's, it's not exactly a complete list. It doesn't include every single thing that uh, we as God's people uh, should possess in our lives. Uh, we could definitely add to it. But just, just ask yourself, do these things describe the relationships that I have with others. Ask yourself that. Not just out in the world, but here in the church as well. Do you feel compassion in the innermost part of your being for your brother or sister in Christ? Do you know when they're struggling? Paul says that we're to clothe ourselves with that. Um, can kindness describe your relationship you have with others? Is there a tender, genuine mercy that you cheerfully show for others? Is there more judgment and harshness than there is comfort and sympathy? If so, that's a problem. As a body of believers, we're called to worship together, to encourage one another to reach out to the lost together. Paul says that we're to clothe ourselves in kindness and how we interact and behave with one another. Are you clothing yourself with the humility and gentleness or meekness of Christ in your relationships with others? Are you arrogant and, and proud in your relationships? Do you act like you're too good to spend time with other people? Are you growing in humility? That's a question we need to ask. All of us need to ask. How about patience? Now we're getting personal, aren't we? <laughs> Have you invested any time with others here? In this church? Maybe with someone you don't think you'd hit it off with right away. Are you still easily offended by things that they say or do? 
Are you growing in patience with the weirdness and, and personality differences that you find you have with your Christian brothers and sisters here in this church? That's what we're called to. Paul calls us to clothe ourselves in these things, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, or meekness, and patience. You know, and listen, I can't help but to think of the folks here who really do set a good example of these virtues, okay? Um, so I don't want you to think that I'm trying to beat everybody up here. <laughs> I'm not. This is, this, is, this is for me too. But I want to encourage you to keep going. Keep, keep growing. Uh, I, I want you to know that it's, it's encouraging to others who struggle in some of these areas when we see how well you, you, you uh, model these things, these virtues. And, and if, you, if you are someone who's going, well, I know I need help in this area, why not, why not look around and see who does well in that area and go to them for some help or advice or whatever, you know? Um, but <clears throat> after Paul says to put these things on, he, he, this, this Christ-likeness, he goes on to say that we need to forgive. Verse 13 now. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Did you catch that? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. What we're talking about is the willingness to put up with difficult people <laughs> and difficult circumstances. And it comes from clothing yourself with compassion, kindness, Humility, gentleness, and patience. That's what happens. Not just this body of believers, but all churches are made up of so many different types of people with so many different backgrounds. And if we seek to clothe ourselves with these virtues, it, it, makes, so, it makes it so much easier to bear with each other. Oh, sure, some could end up your, your good friend, or some people could end up driving you up the wall. But as a church family, there's something that we have in common. We're God's children. Holy and dearly loved, it says. Uh, some of you drive Fords, and some of you drive Chevys. Some of you like the Cardinals, some of you like the Ravens. But there is something that we have in common as brothers and sisters in Christ where we're united as children of God. We may have different personalities. Some are loud and some are quiet. Uh, some are needy and some are, are very self-sufficient. Some are hyper and others are laid back. But we're all united together by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and Paul calls us to bear with one another realizing that really our weird little differences are meaningless compared to what we have in common as Christian brothers and sisters. Now, not only must we bear with each other, Paul says that we are to forgive each other. Whenever there's a group of people gathered, I was just talking to someone this, this morning about this, but whenever there's a, a group of people gathered together, someone is going to end up offending someone else. Okay, it just, it just just happens. It might even be you. So how should we respond when someone offends us? What did Paul say in verse 13? Look at verse 13 again. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Think about that. How did he forgive you? You know, I'm not seeing any gray areas there. Sorry, forgive others as Jesus forgave you. Uh, it seems to be a black and white situation to me. You know, what is forgiveness? Well, maybe we should talk about what forgiveness is not first. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Okay, I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to say that all the time. People need to forgive and forget. But I don't know if that's even humanly possible. Is it? Uh, I mean, if it's something that requires us to forgive, we'll probably easily remember it. Some things are easy to forget. 
And we don't even have to try. You ever walk into a room and find yourself trying to remember why you walked in that room to begin with? <laughs> but then some things we'll never forget. Forgiveness doesn't make the pain go away. When someone does something against you, it hurts, right? Forgiveness doesn't mean that you won't want justice anymore. Uh, Romans 12 says that we shouldn't take revenge, but uh, to leave room for God to repay. It's not wrong to want justice, but leave it to God to take care of it. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we should make it easy for people to hurt us again. Right? Establish some rules, set some boundaries. Forgiveness is not a one-time deal. It's often a process. Okay? Uh, so what is forgiveness? Paul said in verse 13, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. God's forgiveness makes it possible for us to forgive others, and it sets an example for us. Uh, forgiveness is canceling the debt that we feel someone owes us. Just like God forgave us and doesn't keep bringing it up against us from time to time. We are to cancel the debt on the one who hurt us and not bring it up to them or ourselves. Like that Disney song says, let it go. You know that one? Yeah, it's going to be stuck in your head for the rest of the day now, I bet. Forgiveness is making the decision to do good to them and not do evil. Again, Romans 12. Look at in Romans 12, it says, uh, <clears throat> we're told, if your enemy is hungry, uh, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not o be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And forgiveness is seeking reconciliation by restoring the relationship that sin has done so much damage. Uh, here's a question for us all. A two-part question, okay? First, have you been holding on to unforgiveness towards someone? Are you holding on to some bitterness towards someone you who uh, offended you or, or caused you some hurt? And then the second part, what's holding you back from speaking to that person or forgiving them? Maybe you can't speak to them because uh, they're not around anymore or you don't know how to contact them, whatever the situation is. But listen, you can still go to God and tell him and he'll, he'll help you. He will. And I believe that if we... As a body of believers, seek to clothe ourselves in Christ-likeness and bear with one another and forgive one another. Man, there is no telling what God could do here in this church. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, let's stand together as we close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for being here today, and uh, we just bow before you today. We praise you, and we thank you that even when we were dead in trespasses and sins and, and in rebellion against you, uh, we have been called by you and chosen to be the uh, children of God and joint heirs with Christ. Uh, thank you that we can be washed in the blood of the Lamb by grace through faith in him, and we can be made a new creation in Christ. So thank you for forgiving us and setting us apart for his glory. And I pray that uh, in him we'll, be, we'll put on a, a heart of compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, so that Christ is all in our life. And so we pray these things in Jesus' mighty, precious name. And all God's people said, amen. Go ahead and have